Knockback, the retro and nostalgia podcast, is brought to you by, well, you. If you want to learn how to support our show, go to patreon.com slash laststandmedia. Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to Knockback. My name is Colin Moriarty. I'm joined as always by my brother, Dagan, fixing a hole, Moriarty. Oh! oh. Ha- S- started early. It's yeah, it's gross. It doesn't sound right to me. How are you doing, my friend? I was going to call you Mr. Kite. Because you're fine. high. Yeah. Well, I, I sure am. Uh, how's it going in your world, my friend? Everything's okay. On the up and up, except for Graydon. Graydon's sick. My oh. son is a little under the weather. Yeah, he's been out of school for two days. Th- this is the third day. A little bit uh, testing negative, home testing negative for COVID. Seems like he's got a flu bug, but it's kind of, it's got him uh, put out of business, man. He's out of whack. He's got the yeah, high right. fever. We may, there is an odd, an off chance we may see the appearance of a wild Graydon pop into the studio. It's not, it's an off chance. Yeah, that's fine. But it may happen. It may. I, I told him to text me if he really needs anything, but yeah. What's so. uh? What so? What I mean? What's he like when he's sick? He, you know, what? it's so funny, especially with both my kids, but I think more so with Graydon. Like you could really tell when something's got him because he he has a tendency to be lazy and just want to lay around anyway. But you could really see when he's when something's ailing him because. He's just, it's in his eyes. You know, he's just glazed over. He's got that please help me look. And he's, he just wants to rest. You know, he's real. you could tell when he's just knocked out. That energy is just completely zapped. So that's, so he's going through that. So yeah, so I'd be keeping an eye on him, just ducking in, seeing if he needs anything. He's got my laptop. He's just watching some stuff. Watching some YouTube. should go in there and be like, grow up. <laughs> Man, that's one of Dagan's favorite, one of Dagan's favorite insults is grow, grow up. It's the fever. Like, it's the fever, man. You know, it's yeah. that that's the thing grow that just up. Get... <laughs> <laughs> I love the grow up thing. Sometimes I'll yell at one of my family members in the store just randomly to grow up. Just yell really loud when we're in Target or something. Yeah, I, lo- I, lo- I think that's funny. Just it's a funny thing to say to people. But tell them to grow up. <laughs> so let me tell you what I did the other day. What'd you do? There was these, I mean, we can get right into the topic. There were, I just thought you'd find this funny because I'm so, I'm so persnickety, as everyone knows, just very persnickety about things, which is strange because I still haven't set up my studio at all. I don't know why that, 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 that doesn't seem to bother me. Very we were just selective. talking about this. Indeed. But I live in a, you know, normal middle-class neighborhood and that people, you know, it's pretty well kept. It's new. So everything's like brand new. Yeah. You got a new And neighbor. that's pretty cool. So we want to keep it nice. You know, eventually it's going to be all like a rundown post-apocalyptic wasteland probably. So we want to keep it as nice as we can for as long as we can. <laughs> I've lived in these various, you know, I've lived in Boston and San Francisco and LA, these frankly hellscapes uh, compared <laughs> to the suburbs. <laughs> so I know, so I know how it goes, but a few weeks ago, th- there are these like field, not, not fields. There's like, there's like these, these pieces of like maybe three or four properties in a row that separate a house occasionally. And I think this is because they have to do, I think we talked about this, like planted marshes and all this shit to like yeah. on the up and up with the environmentalists, which is cool. It makes it pretty. There's trees everywhere. And so, but in one of these interstitial places, someone left three children's bicycles. Hmm. Okay. And they just left them there. And I was at first, you're like, okay, do they just leave them there? Kids leave shit all over the neighborhood, which I don't mind at all. And it's totally safe here. So they just go and get it later. People I've seen a girl like leave, leave her scooter with like her iPhone on it overnight and then come and like get it the next day and show like that. <laughs> Very weird stuff going on. Here. That is, uh, but, yeah, that's trusting. But these three bikes were just sitting there along the sidewalk and they were there for days. And then, and then I realized maybe no one's coming back for these. And then, so like a week went by and then I was like, is someone trying to get rid of them? Like coerce someone to take these. But the thing is, is that these things were like ratty, old, gross looking. They bikes. were like, okay. I never saw actually bikes so disgusting in my life. I don't know how, <laughs> I don't know how a bike gets that gross. Kids are gross, but this is a key. And detail. so, okay. And they were like little, a couple of them were like scooters. And I was thinking, you know, I've lived in cities. You've lived in cities. Like we were saying, you know how in a lot of these cities, this was huge in Santa Monica because they were a Santa Monica company actually, but bird scooters, like the scooters that you leave on the, on the road and you drive places oh, sure. and then you yeah, use your course. credit card. So I was like, did, did they see those in Richmond and like, are trying to do that here? Like kids are just trying to be cute. Like do that for, so I was thinking that. So I let it go another week. It's a and cute these idea. things still, 
it is. But then I was like, the, the, and it's probably totally off. Way yeah, too yeah. clever for a five year old. Yeah, I agree. So, so I, I let it go another week. And then these things are just these ratty, gross bikes are just still sitting here on the sidewalk in between these houses. <laughs> so the other day on garbage day, I just went over there like it's like 10 houses away, probably from us. And I just picked them up and I just threw them in my own garbage can. Oh, and just and, and just and just got rid of them. They fit in your can. Out. Yeah, because oh. you know, these are like children's bikes. Yeah. And I don't have a lot of garbage. So yeah, I just buy one was like poking out the top and stuff, but I didn't care. And I wanted it to poke out the top because I'm like, I just threw out these bikes. Whomst amongst you. Whomst is a word that Mike and I use. Okay. Whomst amongst you <laughs> did. Did this. And why do I have to clean up your your? Here's what happened. You didn't want to throw the bikes out. No. And here's what I'm noticing about this, about people in this neighborhood getting a little crazy with throwing things away in these wooded areas. I mm. see dudes dumping all their grass clippings in them. I, a dude had a huge dead tree that he threw in there, oh. like in one of these places. And I'm like, we're not doing this year. <laughs> Stones and rocks and dirt. I'm like, we're not white trashing this place up. Common areas as junkyards is not happening. No, we're we're nipping that in the bud. So that's why I got rid of the bikes. I got rid of like some garbage that was in the woods the other day. Wow. You know, I I called the uh, or I emailed the HOA a few months ago to get rid of this old sign. The builders had a sign in our neighborhood still selling the plots of land. Oh, that the fucking house is wrong. Oh, no. And, you know, so it's like all the different plots numbers. That and I'm like, stand. dude, do you guys realize that we're done here? <laughs> Well, you've been done for a little while. I would yeah, say. like the the neighborhood was completed in 2021. Oh, but okay. even then, everyone had. Long. But even then, everyone had bought their land. I think in 2019, I got right. the spec house. That's why I got in here. So right. it's right, right, right. So, um, oh, so I got the house. You know, the I, the house, the spec house is like what they they used to build like a nice version of something to show people, not the model home necessarily, but like a, the the proof of concept. Home. Oh, I um, see. There's a difference. Okay, right. So it's not the house that necessarily. It's like a house that they're they're building to spec and then selling as the builder. Yeah. Right. They're not they're, they didn't sell the land. And then are, as the builder are building for higher on that piece of land like they did for everyone else. Gotcha. That OK. And then the model houses are the very last ones that go out. Um, sure. Yeah. 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 Like the model house in my neighborhood was only sold like last year. Oh, like, wow. When are they going to sell this thing? You know, because they have to like take they have to put the garage in and do all the you know all the changes to it because it's kind of like a half office. That makes sense. Of- yeah. So I just thought you'd find that funny that I'm kind of single handedly trying to keep this place up to snuff. You're taking and an interest in the neighborhood beyond just your plot of land, beyond just your house. That's that's uh, commendable. And I like the way you sent a message by leaving the bike peeking out the top of the trash can. That's really good. But it's very odd because when you were first saying it, I'm thinking my sanitation company in particular, right? If there's anything they'll take, like since co- they used to be less stringent, but now since COVID, they'll take what could fit in the giant rubber made, you know, bin plus two extraneous items, you know, small enough though. If it's longer than three feet, forget it type thing. They have to do a special pickup. So what they do is they send, if you're throwing away a barbecue grill or an old motorcycle or something, they'll come with a flatbed, but it's 20 bucks every time they come to the house. So I'm thinking mm-hmm. these people don't want to pay the 20 bucks, but now you're telling me these bikes fit in the can. That's really odd. If they yeah, I mean, as far as I'm garbage, concerned, yeah. Here's the thing. As far as I'm concerned, yeah. anything that fits in the can, it goes. Oh, absolutely. So if I'm like, I'm not playing any games because they they say like, don't put in empty spray cans. So I'm like, get the fuck out of here. Are you crazy? What do you think? I, you think I'm going to drive the the empty lighter to a to a Home cent- Depot? Dude, it's going in the garbage. <laughs> yeah, as it always has been, and it always will go in the garbage. And uh, yeah, I've thrown all sorts of things in the garbage. I never see. I was telling Micah this, and yeah. this, this comes from dad and learning. And we've talked about this in the past. I don't give anyone tips around here or anything like that. Like we used to do back in the day, like the garbage man. You don't and all do that. it. Okay. However, no, but I do try to just keep everything nice and tight. I don't put anything on the side of the bin. I don't try to have the thing flung open. So they have to get out. I try to make it so the guy doesn't have to get out of the truck. You're thoughtful. And right. So that if and when, um, if and when, oh, wait, what is this? Wait, what is this? Oh, you'll find this funny. Mm. In, uh, interrupting mm. we had a random youtube channel okay that called itself last stand media oh that was doing political stuff oh and uh which i thought was weird and they have like already a thousand followers and i so i i mess emailed them yesterday and i was like you know my name is colin moriart i'm the ceo of all this and i'm like we own this trademark like this is you better change it. <laughs> yeah you gotta change it. 
Uh, and then they just emailed me back and were like, oh, we'll take care of it. I was like, okay. Oh, I, I, was, wow. I was always hoping we weren't going to have a problem. Like, How did on, they man. not see that? They did. I'm sure they did. They, they just uh, thought that maybe it could go under the, yeah. under the radar. Right, exactly. But nonetheless, what I was saying about the garbage thing is yeah. you just keep everything on the up and up. That sure. way, if I ever need them for something or maybe I do th- do that, they know. I don't know if anyone notices this stuff, but I live in this whole meta game where I try to just just operate. But I'll throw a boulder in that thing. I don't care as long as it fits. Well, that's the thing. Go There's in. a weight requirement. And I've seen that pneumatic arm break twice. Not, wow. not, from, my, not from my cans volume, but... I've seen that thing break because people throw like con- chunks of concrete in it and stuff like that, you know. But yeah, I understand. You don't want to be a problem customer, you know. That's no. uh, that's very Colin. Good example. Yeah. Christmas tree. Getting rid of the Christmas tree last year. Okay. Talk to me. Bought a saw on Amazon. Cut it up <laughs> myself by hand so it would fit in the garbage can instead that. of like, you know, just instead of just like poking it in the, you know, the garbage and it's just three quarters of it sticking out and the guy obviously has to get out of the truck and throw it in and do all that. So yeah, just... I just want to be low maintenance or no maintenance sure. that way. It's like what it's my whole mantra about favors. Yeah. I'm not going to ask anyone if you know, if I ask you for something, you know, it's going down like something, something <laughs> is up if I ask anyone for anything and everyone knows it. So I was just having a conversation with, you know, maybe a little bit of an argument actually with, with our sisters and mom about that. <laughs> Where I'm like, why is it that everyone's always asking me for things? I don't ask anyone for anything. I don't tell anyone to do anything ever. Give me an example. I think that the girls and mom look at me sometimes as like a chess piece. Okay. That goes, it's like, it's like family time, right? Like I don't have any of my pieces here. Let's use this lighter. Okay. It says slay today on it. <laughs> of course it does. And and I'm the, I'm a, it's a little tall. I'm a bishop. And they're like, well, it's barbecue time. Colin is positioned. And before anything ever happens, Colin is positioned here on the board. And let's have a barbecue. And I'm like, but I, I'm not even going to be on the board today because I have work to do. <laughs> so I'm going to be over here. And they're like, well, that's no, you can't. In other words, I'm always going to be 10 years old to everyone in the family. I actually said this to Derek recently. I'm like, will anyone ever treat me like an adult? And he's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's curse of the youngest. I think you. Yeah, he, just, he said it quicker than I'd ever heard anyone say anything in my life. <laughs> Well, he knows Dan and he knows Allie and he knows mom. Like anyone can do whatever they want. Like the, the girls and mom can, can, can not have plans because if something comes up with them, they can have something else to do. Also, anytime I'm like, I have something to do. They're like, that's not acceptable. <laughs> this is a plight I never even think of because I'm the oldest. This is uh, educational for me. I think it is. I think it, it's one of the curses of being the youngest. I always admire you always want to be what you're not, right? You want to be blonde if you're a brunette. You want to be the youngest if you're the oldest, and vice versa. But uh, yeah, I don't, I don't uh, envy that. That's um, <laughs> it's like it's that's weird a, to say to people. It's weird to say to people. And I know they mean well, but I'm 38. <laughs> it's like I'm 38. <laughs> I'm a business. Or I'm a CEO of a business. Leave me alone. Got things to do. <laughs> But, Get out of here. <laughs> uh, at the same time, I have to say I'm jealous because you guys are enjoying, you've been, you you are the newcomer to the whole thing, but you guys have been enjoying being in close proximity for a long time and I miss everybody. So to me, I'm like, oh man, I would love to have that problem, but I, w- I really wouldn't. I mean, it would no, get tiresome don't. quick. Here's the thing. You don't want that problem, but here's the thing is, <laughs> is for me, I'm grateful. To, I, I think what they don't understand, and I said this actually at the live show because everyone was there. And I was, you know, thanking everyone. I was like, what the family doesn't understand is that I'm so much better just being here. You know, like I'm good. Just I'm, I feel better just being in your proximity. And I'll see you every few weeks and we'll hang out. We'll have dinner. I just went to mom's house last weekend for dinner. I see the girls, you know, every other weekend. Probably we went out to dinner a few weeks ago. The, yeah, and the girls. Nice. That's nice. And so on. So it's awesome. Yeah. But I don't want to be up everyone's ass all the time. And I feel like less is more. I really do. I'm a really, I don't give a fuck if you're Jesus Christ or some bum on the street. I don't want to have small talk with you. Small talk is talk. could be tough. could be really tough. I don't want to do it. And I really feel like sometimes, and I've said this openly, like I feel like sometimes we can go those entire events without anyone saying anything. (laughs) You'd be totally fine with that. And to me, well, no, I mean, like anything at all, like meaningful, they're like nothing, no meaningful words were shared. And I'm like, the oh, better, the I best, see what you mean. The best way for me to hang out. And this is why I was telling mom the other day is like, I would rather hang out with all of you individually. 
that's my that's always been my thing. I've always been like that with friends. I've always kept my friends apart. You know, I've never really had fused friends groups or anything like that until I was an adult. Sure. And I just feel like I get more out of it than that. Anyway, I, I needed to use the family as a punching bag again today. That's why I wanted to bring that up. <laughs> they it enjoy is funny, it. but they do. They do. They do enjoy it. Secretly, they do enjoy <laughs> it. And I, I feel like it's uh, it's just funny to consistently have to remind people like I have things to do. I, I think the other day when we were supposed to have dinner, I'm like, do you understand? I have like something like twenty five thousand dollars worth of merch in this house that I have to sell right now. Like wow. we're packing envelopes and doing all this kind of shit. Because we just put so started selling those new sweatshirts and all those things. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. You don't, you don't understand That's how much shit is going on. It's fucking chaos. It really is. And I think what mom told me was like, you have to just explain it. And I'm like, I don't feel that's true. Just trust me when I say that I'm busy, and trust me when I say that compared to the way I feel now, I might as well had a gun barrel down my throat in California. So you know, it's night and day for me. And I feel like people don't necessarily look at it like that. Like, well, how this this is the thing I was making fun of them. I'm like, does anyone ask what does Colin think? <laughs> how does Colin feel about that? <laughs> Instead, it's the bishop on the board, the bit the, or the lighter, advanced up and the lighter. Slay today, you know, what, dude. Yeah, and the, the moment you chose Richmond, that was a big comment, too. You know what I mean? You could have chose when you were leaving Cali. You could have chosen to go anywhere, not even just in the country necessarily, practically just in the country, but that's a lot of places you could have chose, you know? So you could have went back to Boston. You could have went up back up to Northern Cali. You could have came to anywhere in New York, the boroughs, the island. Where at, you could have came to Philly. You could have came anywhere. You know what I mean? Could have went further south. So, you know, Austin, Atlanta. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's a million places. Florida right? was tempting. Washington Florida? State was tempting because of no income taxes sure. there. But- Texas, of course, but yeah, I came to Virginia. I, I thought it was a statement too. I, I wanted to be around everyone. And that's what I was trying to say to them was, can't you just be happy that I'm here now? Like I, I disappeared for 15 years. Yeah, you know, I was basically never here. And so I'm here now. So just let's just all chill. And but also the person that went to Northeastern at 17 years old and the person that came back at 35, not the same. And I, I don't think people quite comprehend that either. Not even remotely the same, mm. you know? scarred and worn down and more experienced there and more go. wise and all the rest so it's, yeah, it's just frustrating because i always look around people and i always kind of defer to them and i feel like people don't defer to me sometimes where it's like just trust me dude i'm good let colin cook it's all good you know <laughs> it's the nature first of all you're you're the boss so you have a lot to do you have a lot more on your plate but i think it's also the nature of a creative job you can't turn it on and off like a faucet it's not a nine to five thing. You know, I go, even go through that and I'm just kind of a, you know, a puppet, you know, for whatever animation studio I'm working with, you know, all, I, although I love it and I enjoy it, it, you can't turn it on and off. It's the nature of a creative job. It's, it's different. It's, it's harder to make plans. It's hard, and it takes a modicum of patience from your loved ones, but they grow accustomed to it. You know, you think, I think you're mostly dealing with just being the youngest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just it's just funny. And it's it's first world problems in some way. I mean, I'm it's awesome to have a family that cares so much and all of that. But it's just like, let me well said the one the one thing they don't understand because they've all been around each other in perpetuity forever, basically, is, you know, at least in for the last 15, 20 years um, is I had to figure out how to be alone. Mm. And I sure did. <laughs> so just so just understand <laughs> that I really did. <laughs> I, cause you could tell, I, I would have come home after six months or a year if I didn't have it in me. I, I did what I had to do. I became a, a total rock in San Francisco. It's, it's, uh, it's hard for people to understand that. I think when you leave and you're just this little kid and other than, you know, a day on a holiday or a random day here or a phone call or a text message, you just come back as like, uh, I have gray hair. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's like, it's like, mm, things have changed. I, I just wish they understood that more, but this had, that has nothing to do with this episode, which is usually the way it goes. <laughs> Let's talk about the topic at hand, Dick. So yes. for this month, we're recording now in November of 2022. I've kind of soft floated this already to the audience on Discord, but we'll have more to say about this in December. But knockback going into 2022 is going to change a little bit, not fundamentally about the 
the what nature of the show. It's always gonna be about old things and our celebration of them. But the shows are gonna be a little deeper and a little more seldom released starting in 2023. They'll be the ones we don't do in quotes will be replaced by something else. So don't fear. We'll we'll spell it all out, and I think you guys are gonna love what we have lined up for you. It's gonna be but good. in this month leading into the holidays, we wanted to do all albums. Love it. So we did har- we did horror movies last month, which was fun. Now we did all are doing all albums. And Dagan and I were talking very similar to the horror situation. I mean, think of all the movies we didn't do. People were like, you didn't do Halloween. You didn't do, you know, Hereditary. You didn't do. Yeah, we did do The Witch a long time ago. So which is still not really eligible, but we did it anyway. And that, we did that three years ago or so. But there are so many movies that we've not done. Jason. Sure. Et cetera. Sure. So <laughs> Hellraiser, which is the fucking worst. <laughs> So we we started talking about this idea of doing albums and we had what I felt like was an even more compounded problem, which was what are we supposed to do about about this? This is a really wide open thing. We've only done two albums so far. One was voted by the audience, which was Linkin Park's hybrid theory. But the other we chose, which was Michael Jackson's thriller. And so we both kind of, I think, stumbled upon Sgt. Pepper's as uh, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, the 1967 Beatles album, as an obvious starting point. But then I was kind of confused because you had messaged me, and this, it's somewhat rare for us to talk about things before we talk about them on the show. But yeah, you were you had kind of you had messaged me something surprising, which was that you didn't you kind of wanted to bail out of this one, and I was surprised by that. Not only because the the album's so short, but because it's iconic and so good so i i really want to start with you about you were talking about magical mystery tour yes now now magical mystery tour to me is it's important because it's the it's around the beginning of what i think is the beatles strongest era which is their tail end sure you know you Absolutely. have right you have this um you have this more sing-songy pop song boy you know rock boy band thing going on in the in the mid 60s and then they start getting more into sergeant pepper first then magical mystery tour and yellow submarine and and all the rest going all up to you know 1970 and the and the breakup and all that and the blue and the white i was gonna say the blue album that's 311 (laughs) the white album (laughs) everybody has a color album indeed the weezer also has a blue album their first record so i'm wondering where your mind is on this mm. record why were you comfortable and kind of thinking along the line i was of why this made sense to do and then maybe wanted to bail out to go to magical mystery tours uh, and instead to kind of skip ahead a little bit which is fine i think that's an awesome record too but i'm just confused about that i want to know where, what your thoughts are on sergeant peppers yeah you know what it's funny how it happened we talked about doing the albums for the entire month of november which means we're going to get to talk about four or five of them and you know, that's a, that's a fun thing, but it's also a little bit of a dilemma because which way do we go? They have to be, they have to resonate with a wide audience and be iconic and I guess legendary by some degree, but also be applicable to you and I and our memories and our tastes and all that kind of stuff. And the Beatles was the first thing I thought of. I mean, I thought, thought about the Beatles. I thought about Pink Floyd. We talked about Prince and all that kind of stuff and no spoilers for the future ups yet because you and I haven't even gotten past this album yet, but Beatles was the first thing on my mind. And then it's important to realize too, like the entire Beatles discography is important to me. So there's almost some nature of, it doesn't even really matter where we start, but for some reason I was getting magical mystery tour and Sgt. Pepper's conflated. And then I realized like magical mystery tour was a big one for me growing up. And then it was a big one for me rediscovering it in the 90s with the advent of skate videos and it becoming, you know, classic rock and older rock Motown at some point, eventually disco and stuff would all kind of come into fashion and skateboarding in the 90s. And we would be introduced or reintroduced to this music as a younger generation when this stuff became prominent in skate videos. And then I realized like Sgt. Pepper's and Magical Mystery Tour, I almost think about in the same breath, so it doesn't really matter. Now, I will say Magical Mystery Tour, and I don't want to go on a long-winded rant about it because eventually I might talk about it, but that album specifically is an album of, for me, of 100% bangers. Like Every song on that album for me is iconic and one of my favorite songs of all time. I think the second side of that record is... 
insane. It's like, oh, it's- hello, goodbye, strawberry fields forever, penny lane, baby, you're a rich man, all you need is love. That's a crazy it's insane run of, of song. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Well said. I mean, back to back to back, it doesn't really get much better than that, Beatles or otherwise, in history, you know? So, but then I realized Sgt. Pepper, not only is that one of the iconic Beatles albums, but it's, for me, almost just as good and in some ways even more iconic and legendary because it came first. And it was a really a line of demarcation stylistically for the Beatles and just made me think so so many amazing things about this amazing band that it's hard to even articulate them, the magic, the music. We talked about that a little bit over text. But I, I definitely didn't want to pull out because I think eventually we're going to talk about, every, you know, we'll talk about a bunch of Beatles stuff but specifically these two albums. But then when I started to delve down the Sgt. Pepper's rabbit hole over the last week, listening to the album, fun facts, interviews about the production and all that kind of thing. Yeah, I doubled down on my enthusiasm for for starting here. And I think, I have to be honest, I think if we're starting to talk about albums again, having only covered a couple over the course of the last four or five years, that this I can't even think of a better place to start than not only with the Beatles, but with this album. And, you know, it's just, I'm really, I'm really excited, Kyle, because this is the way I look at it. I'm not very knowledgeable, right, about the finer points of music. I'm not a musician. I'm hoping that's where you could come in. You're actually a proper musician, so you'll have a lot to say that I can't even really talk about. And I'm not even a raging Beatles expert in any way, but I'm super excited and enthusiastic because this album was in, was a big part of me growing up. You know, I grew up in the 70s and into the 80s, being born in 73 with starting with mom and dad and their album collection, and then again, rediscovering the Beatles through skateboarding in the 90s. So, and then, you know, also when my kids were born starting in 2007, kind of the first music really that we introduced the kids to even as babies, you know, singing them lullabies at night, Yellow Submarine. And, you know, so the Beatles being an important part of the Moriarty's from, from the inception, you know, from the get-go. So, and especially this album, you know, just pulling it off the shelf, looking at dad's album collection, gawking over the, the very detailed album cover, which I hope we get to at some point in the conversation. So really, really enthusiastically jumping into this. And there's a lot to say about every song too. I don't think it's filled with bangers like Magical Mystery Tour is, but if you think about this album as a foundation for everything, like you said, that comes after this between 1967 and when they break up in in 1970, man, it's kind of the template. Yeah, it totally. I mean, if you think about, it's just funny how quickly it happens. Evolutions of bands nowadays occur often over decades and be, they released their, you know, please please me in '63, and, and you think about albums like Hard Day's Night and Help, and it starts to change with Rubber Soul and all that. And I know they really liked that record, and but I think with Sgt. Pepper, it they totally the back half of their catalog. So going into the White Album, Abbey Road, Yellow Submarines in there, Let It Be, and which is the last record, those are just insane it's it's as if to me i don't even listen to the first beatles records at all i i almost never have as part from you know familiarizing yourself with them and they come up occasionally on a playlist or whatever but i basically start at sergeant pepper and go and go beyond that you start at sergeant pepper okay yeah i mean that's kind of where to me they become it's at this point that they stop touring largely um or start stop playing their their these these songs anyway they they've never played they never played a lot of this stuff live they couldn't and so this much more studio, experimental, very famous, very rich, and kind of falling apart in some ways. I know that the recording this record wasn't great. I don't know much about the Beatles, actually. Like, I'm not a huge historian about them as far as getting into the, the weeds. I know that there's a, that amazing documentary. I need to, to watch that at some point. What is it called? Um, oh, the one uh, on Disney the, right now. Yeah. Yeah, it's Disney. Yeah, my kids HBO, love. My kids were enamored by it, and it's not. Yeah, I, I, it's kind of drawn out. out. Like you got to be into them a little bit. It's 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 wonderful if you love the Beatles, but yeah, my kids at you know whatever they however old they were when they sat down to watch that were like, when are we going to watch the next part? It was amazing. But I think what I like to think about are a couple of things with this record, mm. and this is where I kind of wanted to kick it back to you. Is this record reminds me of Mom, <laughs> and 
my introduction into the Beatles didn't happen in and I don't know why, but when, when before mom and dad got divorced, I, for some reason, I mean, they were listening to the Beatles, I guess, but they exposed me to a lot of different stuff. I remember at that point, it was like the Moody Blues were very familiar to me. Um, Fleetwood Mac was very familiar to me, sure. stuff like that. But the Beatles, when when mom and dad got divorced and I moved to Maine with mom, I remember her going to the store. She she got a new car. She had that old Crown Victoria and she got a Ford Probe and it had a tape deck in it. This was like 1994, I guess, or something like that. Wow. And we went to Fox Run Mall in Newington, New Hampshire, and she bought a bunch of tapes, I remember. And amongst them were Sgt. Pepper's and Magical Mystery Tour. And those were my introductions to the Beatles at that time. And I remember I just I ate those those albums up with her in that car. We drove all over the place together, obviously. And it was really just me and her. And so Sgt. Pepper will always remind me of her. And I think she bought it at that time to kind of reflect on her own childhood. And I like to think about mom and dad being in 11th grade, I think, when this came out and. And uh, I think later in the year, Magical Mystery Tour came out, and so they would have been in twelfth grade. So I mean, that's just crazy. I mean, that's it's that's the, the that's the era of imprint when things that you love just always stay with you. And so I like thinking about that too, and the timelessness of the Beatles as well. But this record to me is is just an absolute banger, just absolutely insane. And I think one of the things we we talk about with a lot of the horror movies and other things we've done is and games is. Thinking about things through the lens, the relativistic lens of when it comes out and when it was made. We're talking about things that uh, an album that started to be recorded in 1966 and was finished in 1967. And listen to it. (laughs) I mean, listen to it. I know that they had their Beach Boys competition with the pet sounds and these guys were all going back and forth, but there weren't very many salvos from very many premier bands i mean these guys were just way more sophisticated than everyone else and it showed and i think they also attracted a lot of the very best help in production and in studio musicianship and all of the rest right you know a little bit of writing help and so i i listened to a song you know i was i was listening to the i know this record so well but i was i listened to it this morning when i was in bed just put my earbuds in and just sat there and just listened to it all the way through and i think about a song like within you um, without you, which is the first song on the second side, although the sides don't matter anymore, I guess. And I was like, imagine hearing that. What is this? What you never heard that instrument before? You never heard that intonation before? The 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 drawn out nature and the tape manipulation that's going on on a song like that, and all of the early production tricks at a time when people were recording live. So it's. It's dynamite. And it reminds me of, and my, I remember mom making me laugh because she would say, grandma would say to her, what do you, what, what is this Chinese music? <laughs> That's because, awesome. I never heard that. Yeah. Because it, because think about it when you're listening to that song, it is a sitar. It, it's unlike anything you've ever heard. It's probably something that grandpa came back describing when, after World War II, when he was in the South, in, in the South, you know, Southeast Asia. Sure. And wasn't there a, wasn't there a, I got to throw this out there. Wasn't there some sort of story about how he had a Chinese girlfriend? Yes. Yes, yeah, yeah. but I don't I don't know the finer points, but yeah, he did. He did. And he would bring it up like when him he and grandma. grandma would get in tiffs. What'd you say? I said, shout out, grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> he, he would, would bring, bring it her up. up. Oh, my God. And then, awful. you know, she'd be like, you jackass like that. Yeah, so, you know, in a, in, a, in a kind of funny way, you know, like I should have stayed with so and so whatever, you know, type of thing. So I guess it was, if I'm not mistaken, it was kind of serious, like maybe even engagement or near engagement <laughs> or something. That's so, so that's crazy, pretty fun, man. which every I yeah. think I feel like almost everybody has one of those people, right? Like the person you almost thank God didn't marry type thing. Oh, my God. We all yeah, I was like, I'm like fucking Neo in the Matrix. <laughs> I was watching I 300 last night when he kicks the guy down the pit. That's exactly <laughs> yeah. what it is. Arm over arm. Play, yeah. That famous. I don't. We got to do that movie at some time. Oh, at some point. for I, sure. I, I actually am not crazy about that movie. Dude. Oh. It's so good. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll talk. We'll talk it's about so it. Good. It's been a long time since I saw it, probably since it was in the theaters. Um, OK, so I just think about that context of. I just <clears throat> I think it's important for people to. Sit and not look at things through a, a modern relativistic lens, something we learn about in history a lot. It's e- so. I mean, this is an extreme example, but we look at the founders and they're like, these guys are all slave owners. And it's like, yes, 
that's true and it's horrible. It's a horrible thing, but we're not examining them through the relativistic lens. So it's kind of unfair to categorize them by modern standards, although you can and should in lots of different ways. And in reverse, when you look at something like this, that's so modern, but so early and so new, you can't help but judge it based on everything that came after it, because everything that came after it, with the, for the most part, never even reaches its level. And I think that mm. it's so interesting to think about, about it just hitting the store shelves in a record store in 1967. It's, 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 I don't think anyone could have expected this was coming. And that's what I'm so fascinated about it. It is such a... It is a, a real studio album, something that I'm not really that interested in. I like albums that bands can play. And I've seen my my favorite bands play some of my favorite albums. And, you know, I saw Dredge play El Cielo. That was an amazing oh, experience. That and cool. I, I cried, actually. Yeah, that's amazing. And, and uh, I I should have cried tears at that show. And <laughs> I, I, I know that there's a little bit of frustration about how they didn't play this stuff. This stuff didn't. It, it was a lot of studio like i said studio manipulation a lot of production and but i'm like dude forget about that people were just playing guitars and basses and drums in a studio in front of microphones and these guys were like no we're bringing in we're bringing in harmonicas and tape loops and we're going to use an alarm clock and we're going to have all sorts of horns like saxophones and french horns and we're going to use harpsichords and mellotrons and you know hammond organs and it, it's just it's well beyond the production level, the talent level, the songwriting sophistication of anything else going on at that time. And it's not to insult the other bands, their contemporaries. Many of them are great. We love the Beach Boys, you know, oh, um, and, and all the rest. But it's just on another level. That's why I think this record is so incredible. And I think it starts right off with that first song. I love that song. Sorry, the title track. I love title tracks generally. I don't know if that's just a Colin thing, but um, doom, doom. It's one of the greatest songs ever created. Just a nice, nice little drive. And, you know, we were talking about how just the banger is the, the second side of Magical Mystery Tour. But I think the first side of this record, especially in the beginning, you get McCartney and then you get a Ringo song, which is very strange. Very right? strange. And then you get Lennon. Yeah. And then you go back to McCartney. And now Ringo didn't write any of this shit, of course. He wrote you. Um, I am a wall. I am the walrus, whatever. But he performs with a little help from my fr for for my friends, which is an amazing song. And so we just get a little taste of all three of them right in the beginning, and we get Harrison later on, like I said, with within you, without you, right. Um, but to me, I just I love the beginning of the record. So let's start there. How do you feel about the, kind of the way the record begins and these these intro songs? Oh, dude, it's so good. I mean, I had to first start by going back and just refreshing my memory on the Beatles' whole body of work. You know, the timeline, the discography. And again, I know it's been said many times, but I can't believe all of this has taken place. Their entire professional history as a band together before the breakup was only like the better part of seven years, you know? The, and, yep. the, and this album came out, what, less than three years before the Ed Sullivan show, their big sort of American breakout in 1964. This is only three right. years later. And it's amazing to know that Sgt. Pepper and Magical Mystery Tour came out in the same year. Why? Like those are two of the best albums ever created. That would take normal bands years in between to develop those two things. Like th they were so prolific with such a large quality body of work. I don't think there's ever been a band with a better quality and quantity sort of level of offering than the Beatles. It was it's incredible. Like you and I were just briefly texting and I said, "What is the magic?" I feel like this conversation and any future Beatles conversations will be sort of trying to figure out that mystery. Like every everything we talk about piecemeal and break it down song by song and track by track and piece by piece, like it's all the trying to uncover the greater mystery of what the hell kept this band so relevant timeless to this day, never get tired of their music. And that's where I would start with this. I would say every song, almost to a song in their entire, their entire discography. But in this case, in this album, you just, it, every song leaves you wanting more. It's, it's incredible. And it starts off the Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club band. I can't even imagine how innovative this must've been in 1967. And there's so much talk about, you know, the Beatles and other rock bands too, 
you know, discovering drugs and expanding their minds and finding avant-garde sort of philosophies in regards to music and, you know, completely wanting to evolve artistically and all that kind of stuff. But it was interesting to learn, I never knew this, that they were so over touring that a big part of the bent with recording this album and future albums was like, we need to record things that can't possibly be recorded live because we're, we don't want to tour anymore. And a big part of that was the multitudes, right, of screaming crowds, tens and tens of thousands of people drowning them out. They couldn't even hear what they were playing. That's exact. It's so funny you say that because we we were having this argument on so on uh, on sacred symbols yeah. about how I am really against people singing at concerts. And some people really got mad about this and were like, "What are you talking about? You've never been to concerts, I've, dude. I've been to over a hundred shows. You are the person everyone hates in the crowd." I'm not saying when the guy puts the microphone to you and asks right, you to right, sing. Sure, like, sure. I don't want to hear you say that any more than I want to hear you be like, nah, 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 like doing the fucking guitar. <laughs> I don't need to hear you singing. And I, it's so funny you brought that up because we brought up that specific example. I was like, imagine seeing the Beatles at Shea Stadium, which and because that was the show we were talking about. On, and uh, Dustin had brought up. He was saying that the sound system was so bad there that there was no hearing that show unless you were really like right on top of the stage like you just didn't hear it and i was like that sucks that's insane. and it probably sucked for them too they want to play their music and they're just getting shouted at and what's so funny is that's so antithetical to everything that that is rational about music in the music industry today they were making so much money on record deals and on just selling albums which is anathema to the way things work today although people make a little bit of money on albums you sure. make all your money touring as everyone knows and on merch and it's so funny and so unfortunate that they didn't ultimately end up being able to live in tandem long enough to discover. I mean, could you imagine if the Beatles toured? First of all, they could play a lot of this stuff live. They would have to have a sophisticated live band to play with them, but they could do it and they could have figured it out in, say, 1987. You know? Sure. Could you imagine the future in which these guys, you know, Harrison and, and whatever, everyone lives and then they get back together? and play a tour and there's and in and in our made up history there there was like a Beatles reunion from 1987 to 1989 or something like that God, and been. all of this crazy shit came out of it no new records or anything but just all these recordings of all this stuff that's where my my mind flies to the the possibilities when they discovered we could make so much money doing this because that's what happened with the police one of my very favorite bands as everyone knows I love the police they hate each other oh they yeah. hated each other since the early 80s, they hated each other during the synchronicity tour. The last tour they did, they couldn't fucking stand each other. I think if you look at I, I, if you look at um, Copeland's symbols, I think one of them says fuck sting on it. Like oh, when they're playing shit. on stage. And it was that bad. Wow. Yeah. Like they and they like would not even talk to each other. And then finally, people were like, listen, dude, just do a global tour for 18 months and you're all going to make 100 million plus. And they're like, OK, fine. And they did it. And so I just feel like the Beatles sort <laughs> of. God. It would have been insanity. I mean, they would have it would have been an, an, an absolutely eye watering thing. That's what makes Sergeant Pepper so much more special. They never even got the opportunity. No, nope. nope. So it's this mystical thing, kind of like Ben Folds Five's last record for a while before they did started playing it when they got back together, where they broke up right when it came out. So it just was this thing, and it had a very real melancholy to it. That's I think there's a melancholy actually to all the Beatles songs, yeah, and Beatles records, even though it's more upbeat. I think it's a lot of the Britishness. Sure. I think it's a lot of the screaming harmonies. And what I mean by that is it's, it is like Ben Folds, actually, where the way they harmonize, it doesn't feel controlled. They're like projecting a lot. It's, it's like as I, I know this is weird because obviously they all know how to sing exceptionally well, but it's like they don't know how to sing. You know what I mean? Like I can't even I can't even do it, but it's, it's especially prominent in um, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Uh, you know, that kind of it's it's awesome, but it all comes together in this beautiful in this beautiful way that is so musical, even though it sounds so different and a lot of it sounds uncontrolled. I think I think um, I think there's just something really enigmatic about it. And Absolutely. that's what makes it so fun. So what do you think about let's go into some of these songs in particular um, with a little help from my friends. OK. Love this one. Now, the most famous version of the song, I think we would agree, is the Joe Cocker version of the song, which is a cover. Sure. This is the song that would be associated with the Wonder Years. 
And then, of course, The Wonder Years on Netflix has a cover of the Joe Cocker cover because they couldn't even afford it. Oh, does it really? Yeah, it's awful. It's so Ramon makes fun of it all the time because he's like, dude, you got to listen to the fucking Wonder Years cover. Oh, that sucks. Because that that, that show got butchered because of the music. Oof. Famous DVD era release problem, as people might recall, because that song that that I can't even imagine the licenses that they would have had to get to, to make that happen. Uh, but wonderful show. We'll get to that eventually as well on Knockback someday. But I look at with a little help from my friends, this original version is something pretty awesome. And I love especially we we're talking about this era of drug use and the faux pas of it, especially at that time. I mean, it still is. But, you know, get high with a little help from my friends. They don't make any secret of it. It comes up later too. how to smoke as he says later on in um, A Day in the Life. But what do you think about that particular song? And it I feel like it's a pretty, it's a very simple song, but I feel like it, it's a very meaningful song to me. It it, it means something. I, I understand it, and I think it's true. What, what do you think about track two, with a little help from my friends? Dude, I, I have to say, I think Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band and with a little help from my friends is one of the greatest one-two punches in pop rock music slash, you know, pop slash rock music ever. You know, it's amazing. We set the tone. Again, we're saying how inventive it is in the middle. And the, the, the album starts out, you know, you get the sounds of the pit orchestra settling in, the audience, the din of the audience sort of get preparing for the show. And then first 10 seconds of the album, we're not sure exactly what we're getting. And then it just breaks into one of the strongest and most powerful tracks in Sgt. Pepper's, right? That we've ever heard. And sort of like a fun and upbeat energy. With those little melancholy underpinnings, like you're saying, I totally get that from the Beatles. And the melodies and the the combination right from the start of, I think everybody brings something, to, all four bring something to the table, right? The Fab Four. Everybody brings their their skills and their, and their stock and trade. But I think the one-two punch of Lennon's sort of poetry and substance and McCartney's just zeal and his ear and his sort of his propensity to just capture appealing sound. Like he's just, I'll talk more about him when, when we get a little further into the album, but there's just something, McCartney just has tunes. Like he's just one of the most talented songwriter, combo singers, musicians, just, he just knows what's going to hit. It's amazing. And then you couple that with John Lennon and it's like, it's a, it's a marriage made in heaven. And I think with a little help from my friends, it's such a banger. It's one of my favorite songs of all time, but I'm really listening to it and trying to capture what's so appealing about this song to me. And then of course, realizing that it's Ringo singing and that is a rare treat over the, the entire Beatles catalog. You rarely hear that. And yeah, I, I think, think it only, works. I think he only sings like six or seven songs. Yeah. It's not so. a lot. Yeah, you could count on two hands. And he has this thing that I love. Like, I love Ringo singing this song in particular because it sounds so sincere and authentic and real because he has a very workaday, almost blue collar voice. He sounds like any one of our friends who, like, may be like acceptable to kind of okay at karaoke. You know, it just seems like that's what he's bringing to the to the equation. And I know he was very, in, in, you know, um, insecure about his singing. And then you sort of sweeten it and complement it with John and Paul coming in intermittently with their much more melodious and smooth voices, especially I would I would argue McCartney. And it almost feels to me, and I remember thinking this as a kid too. It almost seems like a conversation with that call and response. But it almost sounds like, I don't know, some kindly blue collar dude singing over his pint in a bar. And then it's kind of being answered by some higher power, like almost like angels or something, not to sound corny. And just this, this conversation. And what I love about Ringo is that it is just his voice, his vocals are just so much less refined than his bandmates. And he has that because he has that more prominent Liverpool affect to his voice. That accent really comes out. I think the same thing about George Harrison. And that's why I've always been charmed by George's vocals too. I think of a song like 
uh, something, right? Where it's like he brings something distinctive that you're getting, normally you're getting 90% McCartney and Lennon in the vocals. It's those rare times, those gems always stand out because it's something different when the other two sing. And I, I just love that Ringo has that Liverpool sort of accent. It's so charming and exotic. I mean, a, a, a large part of that might just be I'm an American and I'm getting that British flavor from a voice where so many times there's British artists and the, the accent is lost. You don't even know, you might not even know unless right. you see an interview totally. where you see them speak that they're Australian or British or American. Phil or, Collins is a good example of that. It's a great example. That's a great, a lot of 80s music, I feel <clears> like. <throat> They were purposely drowning out the accent, be it English or Australian, so on and so forth. But yeah, I just think with a little help from my friends, I always thought it was such a sweet song and a sincere song. But again, like so many of the Beatles, you know, so much of their music, especially starting in this era, there's something also kind of tongue in cheek going on. You know, they're kind of having, they're, uh, you know, it seems sweet, but they're, they're kind of having a laugh at us. Like, like Sergeant Peppers, you know, you're such a lovely audience. We'd love to take you home. You know what I mean? Like buttering us up from the beginning, but is it heartfelt or is it more tongue in cheek? Are they having a laugh? Are they, you know, so that's the type of, that's the type of flavor you're already getting with the first two tracks. But with, with a little help from my friends, I remember that sort of rediscovering the Beatles in the nineties via skate videos. It sounds silly, but I remember this song specifically popping up in like the friends section of a specific skate video that we loved. And it was such a great accompaniment to, it just fit. It just worked. You know, we were all into punk and hip hop at that time. And then the Beatles just, that's what I'm saying about the Beatles. Like they could come in at any time, arm in arm with any other music, any era, and it's still relevant and it's still fresh. And you could listen to it over and over again. It never gets tired. It's what alchemy, who sold their soul to what devil? Like it's, it's very rare to have any music that you just cannot see ever growing wary of. Yeah, I agree. I, I wonder what you think, because we, we talked a little bit about it. What do you think about the loose concept? This idea that they're another band basically playing a, a, a different, you know, a different as a different band, a different catalog. It does have that that removal. It's, it, it is called a concept album, I think, but I don't really know what the concept is apart from that. Like, I don't know what it's about. But I know that it was designed to be that way. And I, I love the in, the intention of what you were saying with a little help from my friends, because it was written for Ringo like th th he didn't write it. Yeah. I, I, so I love how intentional it was to say like, we need we want a Ringo. So as, as this was somewhat traditional to have a Ringo song and on an album. And so I, I like that they put them up right up front. And like I said, having them back to back to back going into Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds is is just awesome. <sighs> but what do you think about the whole concept of of being another band. It's so fun. Again, yeah. concept albums were pretty foreign at yeah. this time. They, I mean, I don't know anybody that was doing it. I mean, I know you had the mothers of invention early on and you know, they were playing the stones were already in full, full blown, but they weren't really doing the, they weren't trying to switch up their personalities or putting on airs or, you know, um, leveraging other identities for albums. I mean, later we would get that with Bowie was big on that. Of course, kiss, you can think of uh, plenty of other bands, right? But yeah, Pink this Floyd's was a dredge new for me. It's like, you know, all of those, all those, uh, absolutely you know, a lot of them. Yeah. Genesis. You know? Just sure. Yeah. And you know, it, you know, what's so crazy, Kyle, I know the Beatles by this time in 67, this was May 67 for this album. They were already very successful. They were all four of them are millionaires many times over already. So you could say, well, what kind of courage does it take to want to evolve creatively and all of that? But to kind of leave all of that behind and take the risk of really changing everything 180 degrees, you know what I mean? And going off in a completely different direction and saying, we're going to kind of come back and we're going to do what we want to do and explore Indian music and be more avant-garde. And we're going to create this pastiche of elements where it's like, we're weaving this complex tapestry of sounds and sound effects and ragtime brass bands and calliopes and kazoos and shit. I mean, it was pretty, it was a pretty out there concept. I mean, on paper, it sounds fucking great, like crazy talk, right? And then to make that all work and to actually build that mosaic and make it successful and make it like, yeah, we can't even imagine this album any other way. You know what I mean? Like, 
it's never there's always especially in this album and i guess kicking off from this album onward until the beatles split up there was always that sort of painting you know on this large canvas with a lot of different paints right but it never it always worked it was never a mess you know it never seemed like things were clashing it everything just seemed to integrate and and work and i think that's what's so special about it not only the you know wanting to reinvent themselves with every album which you could kind of i think any kind of creator a writer a visual artist a musician you kind of get that you know what i mean like you always want it to be exciting you want to challenge yourself you want to try something new because that's the fun that's where the fun is if you're going to kind of going back and resting on your laurels with each outing, there's no fun in that. You might get money from that. It may be lucrative, but you're not going to, it's not going to be creatively rewarding. It's not going to be, you know, I would say, you know, intellectually re- rewarding as well. So I love that they did that with this album and kind of set the tone for, you know, we could always expect something a little different every time. And I wish they pulled the concept album thing further. I mean, we int- we get introduced to Ringo's alter ego in this song with Billy Shears, but then it's not really carried any further. We still get the kind of band in the park, carnival, calliope, you know, type feel where it seems like they're integrating, you know, a lot of different musical elements and and tying it all together. But they kind of dropped the concept album thing a little bit. And I wish they kind of carried that through. I'm not really sure what was edited out in the end and what, you know, ended up on the cutting room floor and stuff like that. But it definitely starts like you think, you know, beyond their visual identities on the album cover and stuff like that. You definitely think they're all going to, you know, sort of leverage these new names and new identities for the album. And maybe they're going to do something fun. But Ringo is really the only one, if you look at the whole body of work that gets that. Yeah, I was I was thinking too about you're right. They do kind of present from the first song to the second song an actual literal fictional version of Ringo. She <laughs> All right, track 3 is Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. This is an incredibly strong song as well. Not my favorite song on the album, but one of them for sure. Obviously has long rumored, although I think dispelled at least preliminarily dispelled LSD connections and all these kinds of things. I I don't know. I don't, who knows? They might not want to play that up. It seems a little strange to me, but the writing in this song, you know, this is a Lennon and McCartney song is insanity. The writing is the verse writing is beautiful. Shakespearean level. I just picture yourself in a boat on a river with tangerine trees and marmalade skies. Somebody calls you, you answer quite slowly. A girl with kaleidoscope eyes. That's just, that's amazing verse, regardless of the song. Newspaper taxis appear on the shore waiting to take you away. Climb in the back with your head in the clouds and you're gone. That's, that's just really curt, good, obviously solid English language verse writing. And I'm wondering what you think about Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, track three. I mean, this is a legendary song. This is probably the first Beatles songs I remember hearing. And I remember, I have a very specific memory, although it's odd that my mind selected this to, to uh, call up at any time. I'm sitting in the back of mom's car. We're dr- I, I mean, I was little. I mean, it was before John Lennon died. So it had to be the late 70s. We're driving off to go shopping, probably food shopping. This song comes on the radio. And I remember even thinking then, like, I don't know if I heard the DJs, the radio DJs talking about it, or I heard mom talking about it with one of her friends or one of our aunts or something. But I remember knowing that the song was about drugs before I even knew what drugs were. But I knew it was this thing that you could kind of put in your mouth that you could take and it would make you see things. Oh, Oh, right. <laughs> so, and then back then when we were little, they would talk about, you know, again, I grew up in the 70s and 80s. They would talk about angel dust and all this kind of stuff. I didn't really know what acid was or mushrooms or LSD, but I knew it was like this thing that would make you see crazy things, calling up Alice in Wonderland type imagery, right? Which I know Lewis Carroll and Through the Looking Glass and Alice in Wonderland was a big part of John Lennon's bent. 
I think Lewis Cow- Carroll's on the album cover, if I'm not mistaken. And, you know, so knowing this is like the introduction to flu- full blown Beatles psychedelia, but what I come to beyond all that, and supposedly the whole story is it's not LSD, it's just some crazy coincidence, and it was based on one of little Julian Lennon's paintings or drawings that he brought home from school that he called Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. They have the piece. I saw it in an interview and they said like, you know, John's like to Julian, little Julian, like he was in kindergarten or nursery school or something. He's like, what is it called? And he's like, that's my friend Lucy and she's in the sky with diamonds or whatever. So they did. I love that, that it's not LSD, that it's just a strange coincidence, but it is kind of a, you know, it it gets a little conflated because is it too crazy of a coincidence to know that they were full on like into mind altering drugs at this point and stuff like that. But what I love is what you said, Kyle, it's the poetry, the girl with kaleidoscope eyes, like the, the, the vivid sort of visuals that this portrays. And also like, we're talking about it decades on, like when this came out at the advent of hippie culture and flower power and all of that. Yes. It, the Beatles were not the only you know, purveyors of this popular culture that was kind of seeping its way into America and then indeed the the entire world eventually. But it's the poetry. It's the substance. It's what, it's really what Lenin's bringing to the table. And again, like bringing Lenin's writing, his poetry, the substance, and then combining that with McCartney's pop sensibilities that is going to, you know, just create this blending of, you know, something that's pop and catchy, but more meaningful, you know, and and this is kind of the beginning of that. And I mean, I think part of the reason why any, anybody this big, the Beatles, you could think of other bands, Pink Floyd, the Stones would certainly apply, but across all creative fields, not just music, it's easy to the Beatles are so iconic and so universally beloved that we're always digging for deeper meaning, you know, and we're always with the music, with the imagery, with the movies, with the Yellow Submarine animated film, everything Beatles related. We're always digging for deeper meaning because we love it so much and we don't want it to end. And we only got so many years of it, less than a decade. So I think people are always trying to find something. They're always trying to earn or unearth something. But this is one of those times where it's like, what, you know, maybe it does bear a little deeper meaning. And the fact that the Beatles, re- John Lennon died in 80, right? But the fact that they all remained coy over all of this stuff and never really talked about it to death and kind of were able to, we were able to maintain the mystery and keep us asking the questions because they were never really, they never came down on one side or the other. They never gave away too much. They never, you know, they never revealed the tricks up their sleeve. They kind of always remained coy. And I think, you know, that that's a big part of, you know, why they're so beloved. I think they just let the art speak for themselves. I love just the use of in, in that song, particularly just of, just pure visuals. I feel like I can see Lucy in the sky with diamonds. I feel like I've always been able to see it. I feel like I I can see the rock, you know, rocking horse people eat marshmallow pies line and all that. It's just it just conjures and, up the visuals. And it really does. It's a very visual song to me. And we 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 sometimes refer to things where I learn words through weird ways. I brought bring up often quarreling brothers on Link to the Past or in Link to the Past. I learned what the word quarreling was because of that. I learned what the word plasticine was from this. Oh, this particular song. There you go. With plasticine potters. So good. Dude. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> when I was like, you know, 10 years old. With looking glass ties. All right. I want to skip ahead a little bit here. I mean, we can get back to whatever, but I, I, I need to bring up She's Leaving Home. I want to bring this up mm. because this is my favorite Beatles song. And I feel like this is an underrated and underappreciated little jammy jam. It's a, uh, it's a McCartney joint with Lennon helping out. And I just love this song. This is another visual song. I can see she's leaving home. I see the whole situation in my mind's eye. It's funny that when you capture in your mind's eye a visual from something like this, it always remains the same, or at least it does for me. So I think I've always just seen this the same exact way. But 
do you do you like she's leaving home this is a more contentious beatles song i think i don't know that a lot of people consider it one of the greats i just consider this to be their top work i love this song yeah this was one of those songs that i'm glad i got to go in and listen to a few times and really kind of dissect because it's one of those songs that growing up at least it's kind of the connective tissue between two better known beatles songs you know it's like one of those b-sides type of type of feels but yeah i mean this is a real this is a really special song i think one funny thing that i wrote that i was immediately reminded of the beginning the very beginning tinkling like 5 or 6 seconds sounded like the intro to the secret of mana to me and then I said, I went and looked at The Secret of Man and looked at the the beginning and I was like, I don't know if it's quite that. And then I realized, is it one of the early 16-bit Final Fantasy games that this little musical interlude is reminding me of? But then I realized, I think it just has a very 16-bit square soft sound to it. Yeah, I think what you're hearing, because you're hearing that. Ding, 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 yes. Ding, 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 ding. That's Final Fantasy. Like, you know. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, the actual the sting that all, all the early games has. Yeah, yeah. In like the that's, and then it has the orchestral stuff over it, like the yeah, <laughs> and, <laughs> and the Rousey. It's yeah. so it's so good, dude. It just that was the all, first dude. thing I thought of, and I was like, oh, that's nerdy, but I got to bring that up. Yeah, but, I think I, I'm pretty sure that's exactly what you're hearing. I'll, I'll send you a clip, and and I think you're I, right. I hear it. It's because it's a ding, 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 ding. And I wonder if Uematsu yeah. was channeling Maybe. that even indirectly, Maybe. you know, because it's so iconic. That's awesome finger work too. I mean, it's just it's just a really cool lick, and I I love this. It, it feels like a very timely 1960s story. I don't know the exact inspiration for the song. I I, I do know that it was inspired by some random um story that they saw in the paper about a girl but i don't know beyond that really what it, what the meaning is but it just feels like a very generational song like something that mom and dad listening to it in 11th grade would identify with in some way like their generation spinning off from the boomers going off and doing their own thing exactly. the song is really interesting because it's about you don't really know anything it it is spun to make it seem in my opinion like the parents are selfish but we don't really know for sure. I just think it's a really interesting story about some it's it's a tale. There's a clear linear story through this song. It's not asking you to really look into anything. It's not talking about plasticine porters <laughs> with looking glass ties. So that's what I really love about this song. It's it's just a beautiful song. I've always been attracted to it. The first time I heard it, I was enamored with it and it became my favorite Beatles song. It's always been my favorite Beatles song. It's amazing, dude. And you know what? It's I said the same thing. Like Paul tells us a story. And I realized listening to this album this week that I could listen to Paul read the phone book, you know, that accessible, appealing voice, you know, very engaging. And, you know, this this song is interesting and it stands out on the album because it's as close to a ballad, I think, as this album really offers. It's melancholy. Like you said, it's downbeat. It's got the rousing strings at one point. Has a lot of you know it has a, for a ballad it has a lot of changes and I think that's a special part of the Be- the Beatles magic nothing ever gets boring or stayed everything always kind of evolves even throughout a two and a half minute song and you know Paul telling us a story and then John coming in to sing opposite and then harmonize with Paul at sections and you realize like it's not just their skill sets that they're merging and bringing to the table and you know that's why everything works so well that complementing each other their voices also sound really perfectly together. They, they, they meld. I know John was a little insecure about his vocal ability. And it's interesting what you said earlier too, even about Paul. It's not, when you listen to a Beatles song, you're not like what, it's not like, I don't know what a good example is, maybe Sinatra or Pavarotti or even somebody like Elton John who could just carry a tune, you know, has a really beautiful voice, let's say. But it's not even, you're not even fawning over that in some Dean Martin smooth crooning type of way. They don't really have that, but there's something that both of these guys have that makes it work. You know what I mean? And that makes it smooth and harmonious and, and, and an easy listen. You know, it's not, it's not necessarily having a, an angelic voice, which is very, very mysterious. And then like you said too, a full story with a beginning, middle, and an end and doesn't really ask you to weigh in on the story or come down on one side or the other. It just it just paints this picture, 
And then, you know, even ends on a bit of that tearjerker note. And I was thinking back to being a kid, and this might have been one of the first songs I realized, one of the first adult songs that I realized was telling a story. It wasn't just singing words and making it sound, um, you know, making it sound harmonious or making it sound like it was something um, musical to listen to, like a song they would teach you in music class as a first grader or something. It was actually telling a story, like reading a book or watching a movie. And, you know, it doesn't even matter how simple the story is. I think a lot of Beatles songs have that. They're just, they're great storytellers, st- storytellers in a musical format. There's a really cool thing that they do um, with the lyrics that I like that's common in, in verse or whatever, but I just, I like that they explore it over and over again. He says, quietly turning the back door key, stepping outside, she is free. So they, they let all of this space go. You know, they don't follow the verse around. And I love the line, uh, why would she treat us so thoughtlessly? How could she do this to me? Which is, and then they let they let that line just breathe for a second before getting into the she, you know. But I love the writing in this song too. It's just so again so visual. Standing alone at the top of the stairs, she breaks down and cries to her husband, "Daddy, our baby's gone." You can just see it all. Father snores as his wife gets into her dressing gown. Picks up the letter that's lying there. They paint a picture, and you know what's crazy, man? They wrote this in the '60s. None of their songs sound dated, but also beyond that, the content of what they're singing about doesn't paint a dated picture. You don't picture like a London flat in the 60s with outdated, you know, now outdated furniture and wall colors and stuff. But there's something contemporary about their music that stays contemporary. And I can't imagine when you're out, when you're, out creating art like this, you're not you're setting out to create something timeless. All artists are, but there's no telling. You know, it's all something that comes out in the wash and that could only be that could only sort of be vetted over time, right? So what the fuck? Like, why is it not only so vivid, but why is it so seems so contemporary to 2022 when this is you know over 50 years old? It doesn't make any sense. It's awesome. Yeah, it's awesome. I feel like She's Leaving Home, I feel like, is one of those songs that every day someone listens to it thinking about something that's happening in their lives. Absolutely. Like, so, somewhere. Well said. Perfect. Let's skip to the B side and let's talk about When I'm 64. This is an iconic song. I'm curious <laughs> what you think about this particular ditty, kind of a cabaret style song that they did here. This is such a cute song and I feel like I feel like everyone knows this song, the, the, not only the ditty, the ding, 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 you know, a very, very, it's almost like a Newman style, style, a ditty. And I dig it. But what I like is the message. I feel like it's a really cute song. I feel like it's a lot of people's song probably for them as they get older and with their, their spouses. And I'm sure many, many people wait to be 64. So that song can be about, about them. So what do you think about this particular track yeah i wrote a i wrote a lot about all these songs but i wrote a lot about this one it is very fun it's very funny it's sweet i do ask the question why paul didn't sing this song i think that's a little odd right isn't that a little weird that paul didn't sing this this is john right when i'm 64 no i think when i'm 64 is paul is it paul yeah let me listen here uh it's funny too because i for as different as they sound i get them confused. This happens to me a lot. This happened to me in the in the Disney documentary actually too. Let me let me look. I have it here. It says on Wikipedia. I have the track listing. Yeah, here it is. It says lead vocals. What I'm sixty four. Yeah, McCartney. So he did say. So he sounds. I get. I they as odd as it is because they really do sound different. They become in certain ways on certain albums, not just this one. Like they they sound so interchangeable to me, but. You know, this song, it's, it's again, like I think of it from a 1967 perspective. Start with those jaunty sort of ragtime horns, the trumpets, the tubas, the trombones. Dude, this is a rock album. You know what I mean? It's like, what are you thinking? And then it starts out sounding like anything but a rock song. You know, it sounds like you're walking through and, you know, walking through the park and there's some dudes in red and white striped tuxedos and bow ties playing brass in the, you know, playing a little brass ditty in the, uh, in the band show, 
you know, that's what I'm saying. I feel like it feels like a Randy Newman song to me, you know, totally ding, Randy ding, Newman, ding, 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 ding. you know, yeah. like, yeah, just crossing <laughs> over out of rock and becoming like something else. But then sure enough, before you sure as you're born, before you even know it, it seamlessly blends into an actual rock song. It's amazing. You can't even, I mean, I can't even express when it happens. It's the transition is so smooth. It just kind of takes place. And then of course, this song is an institution. You know, you cannot, I imagine you cannot turn the age of 64 without somebody singing this to you. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's going to be one of those, one of those songs just remembered in posterity. Like it, it's never going to go away. And the clarinet, like it's so weird. Like it's such a weird combination of elements, but again, it just kind of works. And, you know, it really does sound like almost corny in the beginning i'll say it right yeah. and then all of a sudden it's like just becomes like this rock song that you're tapping your foot to and it's like who does that you know who could pull that off but they do all right so one song i want to talk about we can go to anything you want to talk about after this but i want to go to the end to a day in the life mm. i love this song i think the song it's one of those examples of giving your attention to a song and sticking with a song and getting this really awesome payoff. It's basically two to- songs mushed together and with, with two different singers. And I love that. It's obviously based on a lot of contemporary things to their time and people can go read about that stuff. And there's some literal references. The English army had just won the war as a line, for instance. So it's not, mm. it's not being too, too guarded in its subject matter, but my favorite thing about this song is just the challenge again, again, thinking about this in 1966, 1967. Think about that peer. Think about that space in the song, that 20 second space where it's just noise, just mangled insanity. And that's a real challenge to probably get by your label and to get by the various producers to be like, we want to challenge the audience to sit here and listen to this insane building, this crescendo of all of these noises, and then cut it with an alarm clock. And then we're going to go into a totally different part of the song with a different tempo and a different pace. Ding, 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 ding. It's like, it's totally, I'm, if I were there and I'd be like, what are you saying? So <laughs> you have this really beautiful, drawn out, I read the news today. And you do this whole part of the song and then you crescendo to just noise every instrument that we've used, all the tapes rewinding over each other, everything getting crazier and crazier, this chaos. It sounds like hell. It's probably going to have people turn it off. And I bet you a lot of people were like, Bloop, yeah, took the needle this? off the first time <laughs> because it probably was it getting way loud and getting crazy. But if you stuck through it, you get that. Ding, 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 ding. And it just I just love that. I love challenging the audience. I love dissonance in music a lot and then resolving the dissonance. I've I've said I know this is a random um reference, but I want to make sure I think I have it on here. You you know, um I have it. Yeah. The Mike and the Mechanic song, All I Need is a Miracle. Oh, of course. The beginning of that song on the album version has really cool it's like all minor chords, it sounds like, and then it resolves at the end right before it gets into the lyrics. And it it resolves the tension. Like it just, it just dissolves. I'm, I'm totally key. I'm totally tone deaf, but it dissolves with that key, all the tension that it builds up and gets into this like, doo, 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 and just into a total different rhythm and beat. And I feel like the song is the same way. If you can just resolve the tension and stick through it, it, it pays off. It's not, I love metal for instance. I think metal is awesome. I listen to a lot of hard rock and metal, but that's all about dissonance and tension that's not often resolved. Sometimes it's resolved with harmonies and choruses right. and things like that, but but it's often not resolved. A lot of it is just totally drop D, lowest chord possible. And then there's nothing, there's no resolution and there's something about that that's very pleasing, but there's something better about mixing everything together, which is I think why I like rap rock, why I like, we were talking about horns and rock. Like I used to love ska in the 90s. And sure. All these different things that just mix things up. I feel like a day in the life is one of the one of the songs that do that. Do you do you enjoy this song? Yeah, dude, this was great. This was another one that was great to go back and revisit because you you forget you know how good these songs are and how they hit. But I think the core at the middle of exactly what makes the Beatles tick exists in this song. You know, the perfect blending of McCartney's pop 
appeal and his ear for what we're going to love musically and Lennon's sort of, you know, more world dissecting poetry. And I read something or I heard McCartney talk about in an interview that John, this was actually John's song. He started it and then got stumped or hung up along the way and, and brought it to Paul and was like, what can you do with this? And I think McCartney in that same interview said they did that a lot. Like they would never, like they would bring vehicles back and forth to each other if they got hung up and they would help, you know, that sort of two heads are better than one philosophy. They would help each other get through, break through and, and make something of it. And I think McCartney sort of took it and ran with it. And what I love about it is the music. And then I think it's sort of the beginnings of the John that we'll get once the Beatles break up, you know, sort of that poetic, observational, artistic, thoughtful, less concerned with the pop music elements, kind of leave that to McCartney and more concerned with getting beneath the surface, you know, really getting to the poetry and maybe being a little more concerned with evolving the music and trying something new. And then McCartney reeling it back in and saying, well, you know, this is going to be a hit type of thing. And I don't Mm. think it's even... I don't think McCartney's even doing that. I just think he has a real skill for making music that we're going to love. You know what I mean? It's, it's, you know, getting the sounds, the voice, blending all the, you know, he was really the architect. You know, he was really the one responsible for getting these things, I think, to blend successfully. And I don't think he even has to try that hard. You look at McCartney, like, I was really thinking about this this week. His body of work over the course of the Beatles over that seven or eight years. And then look at his solo stuff. Look at his stuff with wings. Look at duets he did. You know, Say, Say, Say with Michael Jackson, Ebony and Ivory with Stevie Wonder. You don't do a duet with Stevie Wonder unless you can bring a certain echelon and sound a certain way, you know? And it's just something that he has. He just has this appeal. I think of like the greatest vocalists or the most respected vocalists, right? In music history. Think of Sinatra again. Think of, I don't know, think of Sting. Think of Freddie Mercury. Think of Elton John, the boss. Um, you know, on and it goes on and on, right? Marvin Gaye. He just ha- he's right in the same field with those people, McCartney, as a vocalist. But on top of that, he just has this uncanny ability to be a producer like too like he just he just knows it all and, and and it's it's incredible it's incredible his ability that he brings and you know the 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 this song is funny too because ending the album with this song it's has all of these elements that we've come to expect from the beatles and over the course of the whole album it's a proper closing but then it ends on that last piano chord which is a decidedly very low key super low key sting it's a real it ends on a low note and going out on this low note and then of course waiting for that blip a few beats right and then that goofy repetitive almost automated dialogue before we finish out you know talk about trailblazing and and doing things that weren't done before but i think the ending of this album again that tongue in cheek nature of kind of messing around like it feels like a little bit of a fuck you like we know this was great. We know this is a great album. We're going to just bring you out on noise. <laughs> you know, we're not going to go out on that like, you know, like let's, for instance, like the end of, um, uh, wait, which song? Let me think. Oh, the ending of, uh, with a little help from my friends. I think it's one of the be- the greatest ending to a song ever where it's like, ah, you know, like it's just, it's beautiful. It's harmony. They could have ended mm-hmm. the album like that, but they end on yeah, this like, coda. yeah, it's cool. Yeah. They could just definitely cacophony. Do you know what right. I mean? Like nonsense. Love it. It's all, it's really like a hand under the chin, like, oh, fuck you. See you on the next one type of thing. Like we know we did our magic. We don't have to go out on that note. It's playful. <laughs> like it's yeah. fun to do that. It's worth noting this. I think most people, I hope most people have a fundamental understanding of the history of computers to know this, but for maybe younger listeners or whatever, this was not aided in any way, shape, or form by any sort of digital computer or anything like Isn't that. Isn't that amazing? At all. There, the, we're, 
we are five years away from the microchip and the microprocessor at this point. It doesn't even exist yet. It's it's insanity. It, it was we, I remember we talked about Bohemian Rhapsody in some way one, at one time. And the story about how they recorded that years after this is incredible, too, because they use they use such sophisticated taping um, techniques to get all of the like Magnifico lines sure. and all of that, like where they just like record over, so and over, over and over and over again. Yeah, it's a yeah, beautiful yeah. thing. This is way more sophisticated because it was even cruder back then. I mean, we're talking about basically recording with four tracks, doing a lot of stuff live and then melding as much together. There are mistakes in the, in this album. Like you can hear or people counting I, and, and um, you can hear like a countdown. Like one, two. Yeah. You know, and you might want to keep that there, but it might be on a track where you just like, well, we need we have a few other hits here where we need uh, during the layering of the tapes. We need to grab a few of these things. So that's just going to be on the recording. I love that kind of stuff, a melding of live recording with a lot of gamesmanship, let's say, in the studio, a lot of recording of just noise and paper and pencils and things dropping and, like I said, alarm clocks and every kind of foreign and, you know, a lot of these instruments would find their way into the consciousness later. But when you think about something like a sitar, it's I'm sure that's the first time many people had ever heard one before. And I would imagine that to this day, that might be people's first, first, uh, re- first interaction with with the sitar is from is from this, uh, the the Sgt. Pepper Lonely Heart Club, Club's band record. So I just I think it's so interesting from a production standpoint. I just want to point that out. It's not to say that production today is is easy. It's not. It's incredibly difficult. There's like so many more options and so many things you can do and an infinite amount of plugins and and whatever the case might be. But there's no doubt that making something like this, making a master recording out of tape, which is what they did here, yeah. is absolutely nuts. And that it sounds so good. It's been remastered, and I think they did a nice job of doing it. It still sounds great. It's too bad that like they, we couldn't somehow get them to record this again right now with, with the modern, just exactly the way they recorded it, but with just better microphones, less noise in terms of just just ambient noise you can hear it you know there was a long period of time where just something being on has that hiss right and you can hear that in this record so that's just part part and parcel but i just wanted to throw that out there too just because i know a lot of people are really nerdy about that that the the, the level of production it's not only the sophistication and the musicianship that stopped them from playing this stuff live it's just impossible to play because they just did so many tricks and I am sure people dissected this record, their contemporaries, oh. with great intrigue about wh- how they made these these noises and what they did. I wonder how people felt about it in that regard. So, Dig, you had said you wanted to talk about the cover. We should do that. This is one of the most iconic oh, absolutely. album covers ever. Did you play? Did yeah. you play the game to see who you could find? Um, no, I I, I didn't because I only know uh, by looking at these people, I could probably identify ten of them, maybe. But in I think looking that's at where the, I landed, yep. But but in looking, it's like okay, that's Bob Dylan, for instance. Okay, it's Edgar Allan Poe. I, I I know that. But even in looking at the names, because I'm looking at a list of the names now, I might know who half of these people are. Yeah, some I like. Amen. And and no that's idea. why I think. And what I think about it, what I think. So for instance, like George Bernard Shaw is on there. I we all know who that is, but I wouldn't know that by looking at him. Sure, I, I wouldn't know that that's George Bernard Shaw at all. <laughs> so what I what I was and you know Huxley's on it and. And all of this, it's pretty cool. But when I see an album, or when I see album art like this, what I love about it, and I think you would agree is, and I think this could be, really be the only interpretation actually, is it's just so deeply contemporary and it's a just a lens into the era and that's it. And I was reading that they wanted to get Hitler in it, which is interesting, <laughs> which I think would have been funny. And Jesus Christ, which I think would have been even funnier. But what did you what do you think about this this cover? This iconic award winning cover. It was so iconic. I think it won, you know, won awards. It won a Grammy for Jan Hay, uh, Hayworth and, and Peter Blake, or two, maybe even two. Um yeah, dude. It's iconic. I mean, it really it reminded me of a lot it set the tone for a lot of albums that would pay homage to this album cover later on. I think of Tribe Called Quest's Midnight Marauders, which came out in like ninety-three. They have all the photos of all the hip hop rap music luminaries on on that cover, but so this was the and I'm sure other other artists have done this too, where it's just to pay tribute to these you know pop culture and political icons. You know, they, I think they also wanted Gandhi on it, but they were like, we won't be able to sell or print in India if we do that. So we got to kind of be smart. 
it's interesting. It's it just as interesting who made it on there as who didn't make it on there. I mean, I love that Marlon Brando's on there. I love that um, Lenny Bruce is on there. Of course, WCWC Fields is big old head in there and stuff like that. And you know, it's it's it also in reading about it was probably twenty. It costs about twenty times the amount that a record label would normally pay to get a record album, you know, illustration and and the photography and everything produced. This cost like many times the amount of the going rate in 1967. And, you know, again, you know, the, the Beatles putting their money where their mouth is and making something iconic. I mean, I remember pulling this off the shelf and staring at it. I didn't know who these people were, but just how colorful it was and how playful it seemed, even as a little kid, when you don't have any context. It's so interesting. And just playing the game, I think I got 10 or a dozen people. Like I couldn't get any more than that, you know, and that yeah, I mean, looking at the Snow I'm White, sorry, the little ceramic Snow White, you know? Yeah. It's, it's funny. Cause like, yeah, Shirley Temple's in there. And then you can, still <laughs> other. you can definitely identify some of them, but yeah, it's like I said, I, again, like I know who Carl Jung is, but I don't, I wouldn't know him if I tripped over him on the street. Not that I would, cause he would be a fucking shambling corpse at this point. But that's the whole point I'm making is, yeah, I, I wouldn't be able. And that's what I love about it. It's just and it's been so much replicated. I think it's kind of it's one of those things where I'm like, I don't think I don't like it when people replicate it, not because I'm like offended. I just think it's corny. It, it, it's it's it to me. It's it's a thing that's that's too iconic. We don't need an, an your example of Sergeant Pepper's cover. You know, yeah, especially because it's been re- it, Especially because it's been replicated so many times. Absolutely. So it's like Warhol soup times. cans. You know what I mean? Right. Like, like enough already. It's I a rip off. Just, we get it, you know? Yeah, exactly. And I, it's just one of those things that was so that was so clever. I'm not even really entirely sure what they're trying to say with it. It's just at, the thing I've always found it haunting and I find it still haunting to this day, maybe even more so, especially having high res imagery because I haven't held the, the vinyl in a long time or seen it close up in a long time. It's just the wax figures of them. Oh, it's so that funny. are right next to them. I just think it's so weird. It's, it's like, so what? strange. <laughs> do you think that they're weird to be weird? Or do you think that all of it has an intention? Because that was one of the things I wanted to ask you was. I would manipulate the shit out of that situation if I were them. People. They're probably kind of setting the predicate, actually, with this record for us, like being another kind of weird and looking and reading into everything we're doing and spirituality and drug use and new ageism and whatever, whatever they're getting into. But if I were them and self-aware, I'd be like, I would do the weirdest shit (laughs) and pretend that all of it had meaning. And I would maybe some of it did, but a lot of it wouldn't. What do you think about that whole mystique? Do you think that they were working into it and with it? Or do you think they were manipulating it and that it didn't actually all mean anything? In other words, is there any true meaning to who's on this cover? Right. Is I mean, I'm sure that there's some indication of a meaning or some sort of intent, but what's the real meaning that you would put someone like bob dylan and you know i don't know terry southern and lenny bruce together on the same yeah no i hear you on that like bob dylan like they i mean they've worshipped at the altar of bob dylan so you could understand why he's on there but why isn't elvis on there they worshipped at the the altar of elvis too and supposedly they said that was a bridge too far like that's sacred so, well, it's just, but can that be because because like I said, they wanted to put Hitler on there. So it can't right. just that can't just be the intention of worshiping, right? Like or like we. So Bob Dylan's on there because they like him, but it that's that's already inconsistent, you know. In yeah, my mind, it's a combination like, well, of a seems like kind of yeah. taking a jab and proper send ups, right? It, there's a playfulness, like there's a sense of humor with the Beatles. I think part of it is being British and just that dryness that's and the wry it. humor. Love it. But but also there is just a sense of humor. I mean, you could see it with each one of them. Maybe save the exception of George, who maybe was super dry and just didn't it didn't come across in in film and interviews and stuff. But there's a definitely universe. I could definitely see it with the other three. Like there's a definite playfulness at some point, like a balance between you know creating serious art and then a a refusal to take themselves too seriously, which. Dude, I mean, how refreshing is that? This is the most important rock band of all time. You know what I mean? And to know, to kind of be that self-aware or just have that personality of being like, all right, like there's a time to get serious and there's a time to just have a laugh. You know what I mean? And and just that's, I think that's what makes them so beloved, like those personalities. It's not just the art, you know, it's, it's, it's what they were saying. And yeah, I think 
a nice combination of of those two things, you know, the humor and the art. And you know, you see that in the imagery and the music and I mean, it's 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 incredible. I mean, it's so crazy to see something you know, have this kind of shelf life. It's it's uncanny. I mean, it really is there's not that many things. Even if you think of a lot of the other iconic bands and albums, just think about music for a minute. Forget novels, forget movies and all that art. Like just music. And we're going to do some other albums, so I don't want to name anything, but like I don't I'm not sure like there's this for instance, there's this age-old, you know, playful argument Beatles or Rolling Stones, right? Like the metric song, who would you rather be the Beatles or Rolling Stones? Like it's the Beatles. I love the Rolling Stones. I mean, those guys are incredible, right? I I just watched another documentary on the Rolling Stones and it's just, it's endlessly fascinating. They're amazing. Their body of work, everything. Keith Richards. I mean, that guy is an enigma, right? But like, I don't know. Is there really an argument there? It's the Beatles, right? I mean. I don't think there's any argument. It's I, I have very, I have very controversial views about a lot of classic rock though, in the sense that I, to me, I look at Rolling Stones and the Who and the Doors and a lot of there's, I, I'm, I think it's, it's all, it's all good. I think it's, I don't want anyone to get me wrong. I think it's all good, but I just, hell yeah, they're. Different. I think, I think a lot of that has been driven by the contemporary nostalgia of the people that have kept it alive. And mm. I do wonder, are there very many Rolling Stones fans, like big Rolling Stones fans, in their twenties right now or thirties? Like, are there really? Mm. I, I, but I think the Beatles. I do think that that's true. That's actually one of the things I wanted to ask you. Mm, and I guess I'll good, just get right into that. Is point. is about your own kids? Yeah. Are are they interested? You said they were interested in the. In the documentary, I was their age or younger when when I was listening to this stuff. So I'm wondering if they got into it. And I I think that is what separates the Beatles from a lot of others is I th- I think so much has happened to rock that it's it's a lot of the it's a lot of the f- it's progressive rock. It's new wave. It's rap metal and rap rock. It's alt rock and post rock and emo and thrash metal and all these things that I love. It's not what you would consider just good old fashioned classic rock and roll. I don't really care about it. I think maybe by the seventies, you start sneaking in some stuff where I start to, I dig it more. You got a lot more Zeppelin and stuff. But even when I listen to that, I'm like, I don't know, man, it's cool. I like Dire Maker. I think that's a really cool song, but it's it, to me, I just don't think it holds the, it stands the test of time like the Beatles does. And I think the Beatles did because they were making something truly new. They were evolving, not becoming the seminal version of something like I think Zeppelin is the seminal version of seventies rock, but I don't think they're Pink Floyd level because Pink Floyd is, was doing something different and created or helped create with King Crimson and many others progressive rock and doing something new. So I just think that that's why those sp- specific bands stand the test of time. That's why I think there are way more 15 year old Pink Floyd fans than there are 15 year old The Who fans. I mean, that's just my opinion. I don't know. Yeah, if that's, actually that's a true great point. I mean, that's a re- that's a fair point and a so, fair thing to point out. What where do your kids stand on on the Beatles? Well, you know, again, we introduced them to the Beatles very early on. I mean, that was the rock music. I mean, when the, when the kids are growing up, you know, you have like the kids songs, CDs in the car when you're listening to, oh, Jesus Christ. you know, you like, that's the type of thing, you know, the Yo Gabba Gabba soundtrack, whatever it is, right. But the Frozen soundtrack, all of these things, but we always played legit, not covers, not kids song covers or anything, but actually legit Beatles CDs in the car when the kids were growing up. And that was like some of the earliest actual rock music that they were introduced to and would sing them those songs at night. Like my song for Graydon was Yellow Submarine. And then I had songs that I would sing to Lil when I was creating her to sleep before I put her in her crib. Like they were introduced to the Beatles very young. And I think again, because it all comes down to like me and Helene aren't like Beatles super fans. You know, but it was the Beatles. Like we both love the Beatles enough that that's what we wanted to share with our kids. Again, it's like that magic, that perfect combination of accessible and artistic. Like they just landed, they they could have never tried to be what they were. They just naturally had that gift. Those four gifts came together. They made this thing. And with my kids, like you don't, but you, you introduce it to them and they hear it. And especially it was a thing in the car and the playroom, like, let's play along. We're going to build with Legos. Let's listen to the Beatles, whatever, pop it on the stereo. But you don't know if it's going to stay with them. You don't know if they're going to retain that. But 
that was proof positive when that Beatles, over COVID, when that Beatles documentary came out, they were front and center for that. And that made me realize like, holy shit, the Beatles music, introducing them to the Beatles was meaningful. And it's something that stayed with them. Because you don't know, you know, and a lot of things kind of fell by the wayside of like, oh, mom and dad, you're, you're nerds. Like, we don't care about that stuff anymore. That's 99% of the things. But the Beatles were in that 1% of things where like, no, like that was a difference. It probably, and they, my kids both, they're not really pursuing music. Lily is a dancer, but they, they both have musical inclination as well. And I wonder how much introducing them to the Beatles at an early age had to do with that. Because I don't have any of that. Colleen has more of a musical uh, background and she has musical sort of latent musical ability. She doesn't do anything with it, but she could play things by, by ear and stuff. And the kids have that. So I do wonder about, you know, how much listening to the Beatles had all to do with that. So it is interesting that they held on to it. And again, if that documentary didn't come out, I don't know that it would have come up, you know, and Graydon, Graydon's still young, but Lily's musical tastes are exquisite. Like, I like everything that she listens to. And, you know, it's like maybe, maybe you do make a difference with your kids. You know what I mean? It's, again, it's That's that so 1%. That's so interesting. Yeah. But I, you kind of live for that, you know? Totally. I, I'll be interested. We're, so, we're still so close to the origins of so many things we love. I think about this a lot. Film has much more distance now between, and music does too, technically, but I'm talking about rock. Um, Film has like much more distance where I don't think anyone really and I mean, except for film aficionados, I don't think anyone really looks at very many truly old hundred year old, 90, 80 year old movies outside of The Wizard of Oz or whatever. Gone with the Wind. Sure. Citizen Kane, obviously. But I don't think people typically go back and say, like, there's shit back here, man. It's just the best of the best of the best of the best. I, I just don't. I don't think that happens because I think things naturally get better and we're getting to that space in games where I don't think there's a person walking that would pretend that the Atari 2600 somehow contains the best video games of all time. (laughs) I think that's a ridiculous statement, even though I love things like River Raid and all of that. And I think music is getting to that point. Rock is kind of at a similar level, maybe a little older, where you're able to kind of differentiate the wheat from the chaff in an historical and somewhat permanent way and bring things forward that really matter. Your Mario's, your citizen Kane's, your dark side of the moons and all this. But I think a lot of things get lost. And I think that the fact that there'll be a, well, not the fact we will have the test over the decades to come as to the staying power of the Beatles. And I, I somewhat feel like I wonder what 2100 year, 2100, the Beatles broke up, um, 130 years ago will they still be this relevant cultural force will people still go see shows based on their music and be fascinated by who they were or whatever or will the deluge the continual and endless deluge of shit and i don't mean that really as a pejorative just shit just content at the big c content will that just erode away everything that is old i often wonder that it, I think about that with heroes, like American heroes. I was talking, I was joking around recently about how Americans are so lazy because all of our heroes are just from the revolution and we've only been forced to have other heroes. Like, so, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, every, everyone yeah. from the revolution, everyone that's famous from the early days from the revolution. And then we were like, oh, Abraham Lincoln, fine. You know, he helped, he helped us. And then FDR, fine. <laughs> but we're like, we don't go out and seek them, right? And I think there's just this this predilection, this laziness to just say, that's our shit. That's our guy. This is how we do things. And so maybe the Beatles can benefit from that, too, because there'll always be the shit and people will always talk about them and there'll always be some sort of some sort of fashionable thing to know. But I also think that, though, important to the genetics, important, I mean, that's understating it, vital, essential to the genetics of rock and roll, the Beatles are. I also feel like you'd have to be pretty hard pressed to look at to contemporary acts today that aren't intentionally stylized in an old way and say like, oh, I can see the influence of the Beatles on these guys. I just don't see that. Right. And that just means that we're really distant from from them. And so I, I, I it's a long winded way of just saying I am interested to see they will be the test of time to see if they become this permanent fixture in music, because can you think of anything else from that time? I mean, think about the Beach Boys. Yeah, I don't think. 
I don't think the Beach Boys have a massive fan base anymore. At not all. the same as the I Beatles. Not even close. And the I Beatles were springing I, off of the Beach Boys. They really admired. I mean, Pet right. Sounds was a big influence on this album. Right. Pet, and Pet Sounds is Pet Sounds rules. And I, I love I love the Beatles or I love I mean, I, I love the Beach Boys, but it's a, it's a that's a good example. Yes. Or you think about the others like the Yardbirds and all these others that were playing around the time of the Beatles. It's like no one or not or fewer and fewer people care. I think if you go and mom always loved the Beach Boys and I think would see um, Wilson live and all these things when he was yeah. playing on his own. Yeah, and, yeah, I remember that. But that attracted older and older crowds. I don't think that people are listening to daddy took the T-bird away in their, their car going to high school. But I think they might be listening to, you know, Lucy in the sky with diamonds. And so I think that that's, it's just, it, I, the reason I bring that up is not to insult the beach boys, but to say that even it even happened to them. that probably would have been unthinkable. I think if you were in 1965, 1967 or something, and you're like the beach boys in 50 years, the beach boys will be this very relevant rock and roll hall of fame style band, but they're not really going to be talked about. There's no surf rock. I mean, there's the, nothing sounds like them. It's not like anyone's drawing up or, or channeling the beach boys right now. That's the point I'm making. And I wonder if we will ever get to that yeah. point. Cause it's unthinkable to think that we've gotten to that point with a lot of big acts. You know? Yeah. I mean, even some of the most iconic bands of the past, like the beach boys, there's just, the the Beatles exist in a in a whole nother class, even from bands like that, even from important bands like that. It's pretty it's pretty incredible. I mean, I think a big part of the Beatles' magic is they were never allowed to fizzle out or become irrelevant. You know, they when they broke up over the course of you know they burned really bright over seven years and then left everybody. They left the planet wanting more, to the point of what you were saying earlier, like having fantasies of them getting back together. You know, John surviving and having all of them back together, like that's for musical connoisseurs, like that's one of the top, you know, that's a wish list thing that could only be fulfilled. Like you might discover that in heaven someday. Like that's everybody's top thing is like, what if they went on and you know what? If they went on another decade, let's say, they could have fizzled out and become irrelevant relevant and become corny and become old hat. Right, so they were never allowed to do that. So a big part of the magic is they left us like every like the end of every Beatles album, right? It's just a larger version of that. Like oh, sh- like no, like what? Like we were on the track to do something amazing. Why couldn't this last for another quarter of a decade? You know, a uh, quarter of a century. So you know, I think that's a big part of the, where the Rolling Stones. I think they're still touring. <laughs> they're like 112. Yeah, it's crazy. And they're it's still crazy. touring. It's, it's crazy. incredible. You know, so there's less to say. We know. But what I wonder, I I don't know. I have a lot. I just, I don't want to get into the Rolling Stones right now, but we should maybe do a Rolling Stones record. But yeah, I, I just, I know they're mega popular. They've never stopped touring original lineup, you know, or near original lineup. That's incredible. It's, 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 it's awesome. It's amazing. It's, and I think, you know, Ronnie Wood died, I guess. Right. And so I think he finally died and he looked like death for many decades. So I since the sixties. Yeah, he always looks 17,000 years older than everyone else. <laughs> I remember thinking that as a kid, like, what is, Me too. what is wrong with that dude? Yeah, he just looks so much older than them. But Spent. But yeah, totally spent. But I, I wonder, is it the draw? Is it, There's like something about seeing a band that legendary and that old that once they go away, who even replaces them in, in that in that mold? I think some things just have inertia and stay around forever. I, I And I think some things just have permanent cultural musical influence, for instance. Michael Jackson's influence will always, always, always be heard in pop music. It's it's just there and, and it's always going to be there. I think it's much more contemporary and, and much more um, fluid in that way. But I don't know, man, I, we'll all be dead by the time we would be able to revisit this probably, but or living on, you know, in some sort of spaceship somewhere. But it would be interesting to revisit this and see if, if who is relevant and what people were talking about. And I don't know. Maybe there'll be this whole revival. I mean, there's already been kind of a, many revivals in the past. Maybe a whole Beatles revival where they become very relevant again. But it's just the, what robbed them of this true revival stuff was just the inability to just stay alive together. Because yeah. the amount of money that would have... They never even got the chance to say no. That was what was said. You know, it was over shortly after they broke up, basically. I mean... Imagine getting to 1990 or 1995 and being like, all right, like, what is it going to take? What is it going to take? And I think you could have had numbers that would have been 
unrivaled, even unadjusted for inflation to this day. If you if you did something like that, dude, I mean, it would have been nuts. I mean, they could have played. They probably could have played 25. They probably could have done a residency at something like Madison Square Garden. Like literally just played there for a year at what the biggest venue, one oh, of the most famous venues God, in the world. Easily. They would have sold that every show. It would have been crazy. I mean, doing something like that would have been nuts. And that's probably something that's probably what, what why I say that is because that probably would have been required. Like it probably would have been like you come to us and it would have been something like that. And I think that would have been awesome, you know, and to just do that. But I mean, even if the traveling Wilburys consisted of Paul McCartney and or Ringo, that would have been, you know, getting three of the four Beatles back together again. And, you know, I, I like the way the traveling Wilburys worked out. I love Tom Petty. I love Roy Orbison. But mm. can you imagine that dynamic of just the three of them getting back together, maybe throwing Eric Clapton in there instead of John Lennon? And then you got, you know what I mean? He was supposedly the fifth Beatle anyway. Or, you know, they talked about that. And the di- they go into that a little bit in the documentary. But, you know, that's... uh yeah, it's it's certainly food for thought, man. I mean, even the fact that we're just having these passionate conversations this many years later just means a ton. I'll tell you, man, go back. There's one thing I wanna I wanna bring to your attention that I thought of when I was listening to Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Not the reprise version at the end, but the mm-hmm. the initial one to kick off the, the album. track. Yeah. I believe that the Sesame Street theme song, the original Sesame Street theme song from 6869, took a page out of this song. If you li- it sounds weird, but go back and listen to the the original, the OG Sesame theme song and Sgt. Pepper's probably like 30 seconds of the way in. There's something there. It's that jangly sort of driving thing going on with the piano, guitar, whatever it is that is like, oh shit. And you know, if you look at it period wise, it would make sense. Like it would gel together, which is, you know, That's which interesting. Is pretty crazy. I love that. I love that. You know, and the it thing would be cool. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go I was ahead. just going to say this thing with McCartney with something I realized about him, like just in listening to this album again, and I think something he always had, and again, carried it, carried through his career was that he doesn't need, he's one of those weird dudes. Like he doesn't need an alter ego and he doesn't need a lot of poetic or so-called poetic substance or subtext or deeper meaning in his music for it to resonate. It's just so rich, so agreeable, and so pleasant without all that. And then if you add a little tongue in cheek in there and a little playfulness, like I do think like, I don't know if it's just news to me and that's why I'm, I'm, I'm so enamored with this idea right now. But like, I think listening to his album made me realize that he's probably single-handedly one of the most important musicians that ever existed. Oh, yeah, just no in doubt. what he brings. And what he contributes, it's, it's, and I know he was a perfectionist and I know George and John found it in particular difficult to work with him, especially towards the end. But I don't know, man, there's just something magical there about his abilities and it transcends the Beatles, but you, it's, it's really cool to go back and see it and see him operating with these three other guys in the Beatles proper. I think that's where it's the most fascinating. We have wings later on and the solo efforts and everything mm-hmm. musically that he got involved with. But like McCartney is just like, I'm off on this McCartney in this McCartney. I'm tumbling down this rabbit hole. And it's like, it's pretty amazing to be that good at anything, you know? And he just did. And I feel like you don't hear that a lot. You hear a lot about John Lennon. And again, you know, this is a superstar that fizzled out and was snatched from us way before his time and McCartney got to, you know, got to live on for many years after that. So it's not the same kind of conversation. There's a lot of conjecturing with Paul, uh, with John Lennon, cause we miss what we could have and probably would have gotten. But with McCartney, man, it's just like unbelievable. Like, I feel like he's like a musical super genius or something. And I never really, I don't know if I ever really knew that. Yeah, I guess I guess you have to kind of it's it's intuitive and obvious and it you you kind of have to sit and think about it, the staying power and again just the like you said just the hypotheticals of the various combinations that could have been. It's sad. It's too bad, but something we have long been over as as a course of real history. So we move on. Well, that's Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, the Beatles record from 1967. You can go check it out wherever you like. It's available everywhere. And must listen to if you haven't listened to it already. Definitely check it out. Um, Dig. 
Let's leave with a dad joke. Let's leave with a dad joke. You know what, Kyle? We didn't mention this. It's worth mentioning. Oh. Mom was supposed to be a 15 year old mom was supposed to be at that iconic Shea Stadium Beatles concert. Yeah, that came up on Sacred Symbols recently. You guys talked yeah. about it? Yeah. yeah. It's uh, incredible. When, when we talked about that show, that, that came up. Yeah, it's, it, it is incredible. It would have been funny too, because then we could have had a firsthand story about how she didn't hear anything. <laughs> yeah, exactly. She could have been, she could have uh, bear witness for that. that exactly. Nobody, everybody exactly. got their eardrums blown out. Yeah, she, the one time she got grounded, supposedly my, our grandparents uh, said, you can't go to the concert and kept her home and she missed it. She missed that. I mean, she, that that's probably, can you think of another event where it's like, you could say like, I was there for that? No, I, I would say other than Woodstock, it was it's the most famous show of all time. That like that it's insane, dating show. right? Yeah, unbelievable. Sorry about that, mom. It's important to yeah, it sucks. It's important to again look at it through the historical relativistic lens of well, no one was touring like this. No one was filling in baseball stadiums like this and playing rock and roll like this. I mean, you had your Elvis, you had Elvis and some other acts, but it wasn't quite like this. No. And no, no, that's an iconic show because I really feel like it was the, one of the first of its kind. And, and of course, I don't think anything will be more famous than Woodstock, but it's certainly up there. So, and, and they did play a lot. That was it. 66 yep. was it, right? That was done. Yeah, they were basically done playing it. That. Yeah. <laughs> that's incredible, dude. That's why I just, it, we, it's incredible. not that we, it's not only the songs they released on Abbey Road and the White Album and all this. It's that we didn't hear any of them. <laughs> like, they never played them. It's very frustrating because anyone who, I mean, I don't want to speak for everybody, but I would imagine anyone who loves music loves hearing their favorite bands play their music, play the music. Sure. Like I love listening to records, but when you listen, one of the reasons I love 311 so much is because they are very, very good. Like very, very, you might not like the music. That's totally fine. But if you do, they can play everything they're doing on the record even better live. It sounds even better. That's why they have so much staying power. And I, so that is a disappointing facet of it is that we never quite experienced their, their best material. Yeah, which is no, exactly. Bad. Yeah. Yeah. And I would think and, that and I do think bragging rights I, I, for bands, right? Like to be able yeah. to do that and to do that for your fans too, to, you know, service your, oh, service your fans that way, you know. Totally. I, I and I, like, it's like I said, it, they could have made anything happen after a while and it would have totally been fine. All right. We got, we got cut off here uh, right at the very last moment. Yeah, all our tools are failing us lately. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Telling us not to do this anymore. I don't know. <laughs> podcasting go go into the woods and live a more normal life i have no idea i think that's what it is uh, i don't know i think it's just everything sucks right now like the tech wise i don't know what's going on with zencaster we riverside it all fucking sucks but um all right nonetheless let's end like we always do with the dad joke all right let's do this my friend kyle i think my wife my wife is putting glue on my antique weapons she denies it but i'm sticking to my guns that's dumb. We should have never come back and recorded this. Favorites. We should have never recorded this one. We should have just <laughs> let it let the episode end abruptly. Oh, our taste and dad jokes just we can't we can't gel on that. That well, was literally was one of my favorites in months. <laughs> it's it, it's a go. I mean, they're all bad. That's the they're thing. All bad, they're all yeah. bad. How bad can they be? I mean, it's the kind of the point. All right, my friend. Well, it was good to see you. Good to talk to you about a little bit of music. We'll get together next week for another record. Yes, um, I'm excited. And uh, until then, thank you all out there for your love, kindness, and support of all things Knockback. We appreciate you, and we'll see you next time for more. Until then, goodbye. Goodbye. Knockback, a retro and nostalgia podcast, is a product and trademark of Last Stand Media and Collins Last Stand LLC, and is recorded from Central Virginia and the Philadelphia suburbs, USA. The show is conceived by and is produced by me, Colin Moriarty. My co-host is Dagan Moriarty. Knockback's executive producer is Dustin Furman, and the show is edited by associate producer Ben Smith. As you know, all of Last Stand Media's shows, including Knockback, are fan-funded on Patreon at patreon.com slash laststandmedia. The following names are at the producer support level or higher on Patreon, and we're grateful for your kindness and generosity. 